human brain's pretty important organ. It's where we keep all of our thoughts, memories, and emotions. It's the thing that makes sure we keep breathing and our circulatory system keeps working without us having to constantly think about it. And it's also the organ that is shrouded in the most mystery. Of all the organs in the human body, the brain is by far the one that we have the least understanding of. For example, we know how memories are stored, but we don't really know how they're retrieved. We understand that it's basically the same process in reverse, but what triggers our brain to retrieve a memory, and how does it know where to find it? The one great thing about our lack of understanding about the brain is that it means we're constantly making new discoveries and advancements in the field of neuroscience, which is exciting. Every year, it seems to be filled with dozens of major breakthroughs, and the pace shows no signs of slowing down. So today, we're going to look at some of the most recent and incredible discoveries. Let's jump in! Multiple sclerosis, or MS, is the most common demyelinating disease. These are diseases in which the myelin sheaths of neurons become damaged. This damage disrupts the nervous system's ability to send signals and can result in physical, mental, and psychiatric problems. While MS is the most common of this class of diseases, it's still quite rare, occurring in only about three hundredths of a percent of the world's population. Currently, there is no cure for MS. Treatments exist to try and manage symptoms and attempt to slow the progression of the disease, but there is no way to completely stop or reverse the damage that has already been done. One of the things that has made the search for a cure so difficult is that we don't even know the cause. However, a 2022 study from Harvard Medical School published in Science, one of the world's top academic journals, suggests that MS may be caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. According to a senior author on the paper, Alberto Asherio, MS has been considered for many years an autoimmune disease of unknown etiology. I think this study establishes that the immune process that leads to brain damage is driven by infection with EBV. There has been circumstantial evidence and speculation for years that the two conditions may be linked, and EBV is already linked to childhood neurological disorders like Alice in Wonderland syndrome and acute cerebellar ataxia. But because symptoms of MS typically onset between the ages of 20 and 40, the link of EBV was an extremely difficult hypothesis to reach. EBV is a type of herpes virus that is present in over 90% of adults worldwide. The prevalence of this virus meant that in order for a study to attempt to draw any sort of meaningful conclusions, it was going to need a gargantuan sample size. This sample size came from the United States military and the Department of Defense Serum Repository. All U.S. military personnel are required to give a blood sample at the start of their service and again every two subsequent years. The main purpose of this was to check for HIV, but it gave researchers access to over 62 million samples from over 10 million people. Within this sample, they found that 94.7% of total individuals involved tested positive for EBV, while 99.9% .9 of those with MS tested positive for the virus. There were 801 cases of MS among the 10 million people sampled, and 800 of them also tested positive for EBV. While the 99.9% .9 positive rate is interesting, given that the base rate was nearly 95%, it's hard to draw any firm conclusions from this. The more compelling information came from those that initially tested negative for EBV. Because many of the individuals involved in the study had multiple samples from different years, there were a number of people who initially were negative for EBV, but then tested positive in a later sample. Of the 35 people who initially tested negative for EBV but later went on to develop MS, all but one of them first tested positive for EBV before any symptoms of MS began to manifest. Of these who initially tested negative and did not develop MS, only 57% went on to later test positive for EBV. So, what all of that means is that for those who did not already have EBV at the time of their first blood sample, contracting the virus made them 32 times more likely to develop MS. This is very strong evidence that MS is somehow a complication of EBV infection, but there is still at least one missing piece that's yet to be identified. If EBV alone was enough, then over 90% of adults would suffer from MS instead of just a fraction of a percent. But because there is strong evidence that the two conditions are linked, we may now see a focus on attempting to create a vaccine or antivirals for EBV as a means of preventing MS. decades. 
decades, scientists have been studying the possibility of restoring movement to victims of spinal injuries who suffered paralysis. Efforts range from exoskeletons like the one depicted in the short-lived superhero show Mantis to implanting electrodes to stimulate the nerves in the spinal cord. While progress has been made in several areas, it is the latter that is beginning to show the most promise. Several experiments over the years have seen patients regain the ability to stand and walk with varying degrees of success. The current procedure is called Epidural Electrical Stimulation, or EES, and it involves implanting electrodes into the lower spinal cord. In many cases, those who were previously paralyzed showed dramatic improvement as quickly as the day after the electrodes were implanted. It's still a somewhat slow process that requires training and physical rehabilitation, but patients could regain the ability to walk as well as regaining bowel, bladder, and sexual function. But despite all of the promising successes that were being seen, scientists didn't actually have any idea why this worked. Fortunately, a recent study may have changed that by identifying what neurons were responsible for restoring functions. Neuroscientist Grégoire Cortine from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology sought to better understand the internal process that was taking place. They worked with nine spinal paralysis patients, six of whom had retained some feeling in the lower half of their body, and three of whom had complete sensorimotor paralysis. Over the course of the five-month trial, researchers obtained pictures of the spinal activity of the patients before and after undergoing their treatments. Much to their surprise, the spinal cords actually showed less activity after treatment than before. This suggested that only some of the neurons being stimulated by EES were relevant to helping the patients recover. Now, to better understand what was going on, the scientists decided to recreate the experiment using mice. Through repeated use of EES, they were able to identify a specific subpopulation of neurons that contained two genes that became activated after the stimulation. To verify that these neurons were essential to the recovery process, they manipulated their activity through a few new experiments. When they activated this population of neurons in paralyzed mice, they regained their ability to walk. When they performed EES while blocking stimulation to these neurons, the mice remained paralyzed. Interestingly, blocking the activity of these neurons in healthy mice had no ability on their already existing ability to walk, indicating that these neurons are only crucial for recovery after a spinal injury rather than always being vital for movement. These results, along with the data from the human subjects, were finally published in 2022 in the weekly scientific journal Nature. It still requires human trials, but this could be a major step forward for EES, a procedure which has already yielded seemingly miraculous results. By isolating the specific neurons that are required to recover mobility of the limbs, it would not only increase the efficacy of the treatment, but reduce the emergence of any side effects that could result from electrocuting larger areas of the spine. One of the big unanswered questions of the universe is, what happens after we die? While it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to answer that question, scientists may have accidentally answered the question of what happens while we die. There are countless reports from people who face near-death experiences of their life flashing before their eyes in events known as life review. There was some debate over whether this was a real phenomenon, although the amount of anecdotal evidence did seem pretty staggering. However, even though reports of life review have existed for thousands of years, there was never any scientific data to support the claims. So, as hard as it may be to believe, given our intense desire to better understand the human brain and how it works, scientists had never scanned somebody's brain while they were dying. This finally changed, entirely by accident, with the results being published in February of 2022 in Frontiers of Aging Neuroscience. Doctors were performing a continuous electroencephalogram, an EEG, on an 87-year-old epilepsy patient to monitor him for seizures. While the recordings were being taken, the man suffered a heart attack. In accordance with the wishes of the patient and his family, doctors did not try to resuscitate him, but they continued to monitor his brain activity. In total, they recorded about 15 minutes of brain activity around the time of death. They focused their attention on the brain waves during the 30 seconds both before and after the heart stopped working. During this time, they saw a major increase in gamma brainwave activity. These frequencies of brain waves are associated with memory retrieval, meditation, and dreaming. There are two main takeaways from this research. The first is that a person's life really may flash before their eyes while they're dying. The second is that it fundamentally challenged our understanding of when exactly life ends. The brain remains active and coordinated during and after the transition to death, at least death as we had previously defined it, and the brain may actually have been orchestrating the entire process of death. 
While this is an exciting development that also raises a lot of questions, it's also important to remember that we only currently have a sample size of one human. The researchers actually waited six years after the man died to publish their findings in the hopes that they could find readings from other dying brains to support their ideas, but this seems to be the one and only time such readings have been taken. These findings can't yet be assumed to be universal, especially because the patient had epilepsy, which is known to affect gamma wave activity. However, experiments with rats have shown that they experience similar gamma wave activity surrounding the time of death. This means it's possible that life review may not only be universal among humans, but also all mammals. In 2006, Japanese doctor Shinya Yamanaka made a scientific breakthrough that would shock the world, including himself. He discovered that by taking skin cells from mice and using a virus to inject 24 carefully selected genes into the cells, they would transform into cells that looked and behaved like embryonic stem cells. These cells were named Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells, or IPS. After numerous repeated trials with mouse, because Ayamanaka genuinely could not believe that his experiment had worked, it was time for him to try it with human skin cells. Once again, the experiment was successful, and the discovery of IPS has revolutionized stem cell research. One of the main areas in which IPS is being experimented with is in the creation of lab-grown organs. One of the current limitations of using IPS is one of scale. Though the cells can be turned into any other type of human cell, it becomes difficult to keep the cells alive once the structure reaches a certain size. So while IPS was used to grow small pieces of brain, known as brain organoids, in labs, these organoids were only about the size of a piece of popcorn with limited functionality. In 2021, researchers out of UCLA made a huge breakthrough by successfully aggregating brain organoids into a larger 3D structure with much more complex neural activity. While it's not the same as having a fully functioning brain, this was still a major step forward with multiple important applications. Researchers were able to grow organoids that replaced the functional activity of different parts of the brain. Their initial research was focused on patients with Rett syndrome, a condition that causes seizures. By creating these organoids, they were able to observe patterns of electrical activity that resembled the onset of seizures without having to endanger a patient by trying to induce seizures in them. The research shows that at least certain aspects of brain function can be isolated in a laboratory setting and studied. A big advantage is that these organoids can be grown to mimic both normal and disease brain functions. This will allow future research both to gain a better understanding of how our brains work in general as well as being able to isolate and closely study the effects of various neurological neurological conditions. Organoids are also being used to test drugs, and ideally, this research could eventually remove the need for a lot of animal and human testing. Unfortunately, there are, of course, some limitations. Even with the aggregated organoids, it's nowhere near the size or complexity of a complete human brain. They also aren't replicating the brain perfectly. For example, the organoids don't contain blood vessels. They also more closely resemble a brain in early development rather than an adult brain. And this makes sense because it's new brain matter grown from essentially embryonic stem cells. But because it is unlikely they will ever be able to mimic an adult brain, it is expected that at least some of these limitations will never be overcome. But limitations or not, scientists are still growing pieces of human brains in labs to study neurological function and test the effects of drugs, and that's pretty f cool if we're honest. Thanks for watching.